Hello, everybody, and welcome to Astro Stream. Today, we are joined with our guest Pedro, who is from Portugal, and I'm so happy to tell you all that you guys are uh, into this very amazing session, and you are watching this because you filled our survey, which is Apna Survey. And uh, those of you all who filled the survey are only watching this session for now, but later on we will also make it public. But make use of this and do drop in your questions throughout the session, and uh, Pedro will answer those at the end. So hi, I'm Shweta from Astronera, and um, uh, I welcome you, Pedro. Um, Astronera is an initiative where uh, we host online sessions with hosts around the globe, scientists, astrophysicists who are there to answer your questions and tell you amazing stuff about astronomy. So introducing Pedro, he is uh, from Portugal and uh, he is a scientist astrophysicist. He works primarily about the atmospheres of the planet. And he's a researcher at the Institute of Astronomy and Space Sciences, and he's also faculty at the University of uh, University in Portugal. So, welcome, Pedro, and uh, we can start our session. Over to you. So, hi everyone, I hope that you can hear me, and uh, so let's fasten our seatbelts, because we are going to space now. So, uh, thanks for uh, having me today, and uh, so um, I will speak about uh, the possibilities of for humankind to uh, travel and to inhabit in other planets, mainly at the first stage in the solar system and after that going to further away. Uh, so it's still a dream, of course, but uh, science starts with dreams. So the first step will be going to travel on the solar system and to interplanetary travels uh, around our sun. So, we have plenty of planets and moons in our solar system and as you can see uh, in this image, you see that pl pl uh, planets are aligned in the same uh, surface, like olives in a pizza. But as you can see from this image, Pluto is uh, far away from the surface. Is that linked with the reclassification of Pluto as a dwarf planet and not a planet like Saturn or Earth or Venus? Yes, of course. Perhaps uh, we'll have questions about that and we can discuss if, if uh, that uh, issue will arise. Okay, so we also have a huge set of moons in our solar system and connected with different planets, as you can see. So, in fact, Jupiter and Saturn and also Uranus are a little bit like tiny uh, micro uh, stellar uh, systems, like uh, the solar system itself. As you can see with several moons going around in orbit, these, uh, these gas giants and icy giants. So, I would say that the first step will be training on Earth. So, we can go uh, to the sea and perhaps to have uh, some uh, uh, <clears throat> settlement in the in, in the sea and try to live in a comfortable and secure way. We can do that. Yes, there are already some projects uh, in in uh, in order to uh, uh, show uh, these abilities that we can, uh, in fact, live and uh, uh, in a secure and, and comfortable way. Uh, 
on the sea. So now let's go to the space and see uh, <clears throat> what, uh, what are the projects that we can follow, the agencies that you can use. And in the screen now you see uh, the mission operations from European Space Agency. And you, you also see here, if you see my cursor, here on the left, uh, on the up, up level uh, on the slide, you see some uh, missions that are uh, flying or already flown on, on, the, on the solar system. So we have plenty of uh, projects uh, flying uh, in space today. Some, some in, in uh, they already ended their mission as the Cassini Eigen's mission. It was a huge success, or the Rosetta mission that uh, went to discover more to explore <coughs> the comets. <coughs> some are still in operations, like Mars Express. Uh, some already <coughs> ended their operations, like Venice Express. With which mission I was connected with an instrument called Virtish, and also Bepi Colombo that is in his way in its way to uh, Mercury and will perform a flyby to Venus uh, in August, so in two or two, three weeks, and we will be observing from from the ground with telescopes in order to uh, support this flyby of Bepi Colombo. Okay, so. Here you can see several missions that we can use for explore the solar system and further away. And we are connected in our institute with several of these uh, uh, missions like Euclid, Cheops, Gaia, and uh, Herschel, not anymore, but Planck, and uh, <coughs> Lisa. So uh, these are our all, some of the projects that I was discussing, so let's move on. And one thing that we already know, that is the human being can uh, endure for uh, some periods of time on space in a confined uh, uh, environment, like in the ESS, in International Space Station. And so it's a first step in order to learn how to live in, uh, out from our uh, lovely planet Earth. So, but uh, start from the beginning here, you can see the first uh, space mission, Venera 1, that was in fact sent to another uh, body on the solar system and was not to the moon. As you can see in the, ima in the image, was a, a launch in direction of Venus. Of course, was the first attempt and the space is dangerous and so uh, it was just <clears throat> a probe but in fact we lost contact a couple of uh, uh, time after so we can also prepare in advance and uh, also complement complement the space observations from the ground i use that very often so use uh, space observations at and at the same time use ground-based observations so I use very often these uh, uh, telescopes that you see here. Uh, the VLT on the bottom uh, right, the very large telescope in the, the Atacama Desert on Chile. And on the upper image, you can see the Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii, in Big Island of Hawaii, where I go uh, and observe very, very often. Okay, so we we have uh, on the solar system different of difference of sizes as you as we can see here uh, the relative sizes of of the planets on the solar system and also we can compare the relation between the orbits uh, in a proportional way as you can see here on the right side so the first step of the mankind on other on other uh, body was as you can see and you all know in the moon, in the, it's uh, 52 years from now, more or less, was in the 20th of July, uh, 52 years ago. But, well, we don't know if, uh, in fact, there are some controversy about who arrived first to the moon. Well, it's just to 
play around a little bit with you about this. Of course, that was Neil Armstrong and, uh, and Buzz Aldrin that were the first human uh, stepping on the moon. Here, about the moon now, something that is very important is to uh, search for water, ice of water, because water will be very important if you have a colony of the humankind in the moon on the next years. Here I can, uh, and I'm, I want to share with you that there was an important study from India, from Chandrayaan-1, uh, that mapped the uh, surface water on the moon uh, some years ago. And so this is really important to find water in other bodies, as we, are, we will see about Mars, for instance. So, but re, uh, discussing about the moon, well, uh, I want to share with you something that is very new in, uh, in science, not this image. This image we know already for a long time, that this is one of the uh, strongest hypotheses about the formation of the moon, that was a body that we call Theia, that collided with Earth and in fact, literally ripped out a little bit of Earth that uh, went on, on orbit and after by accretions, meaning the agglomeration of the pieces, uh, um, led to the, what we know about the Moon. So the news, this we know for a long time. The thing that I want to share with you that, is, that doesn't come in the books yet, so I hope that you will find interesting, because it's a brand new information, that is, now we have the evidence, the scientific evidence, that Earth has much more water than the water that came from asteroids, comets, and also from the protoplanetary nebula, so the material that accreted to form Earth, because Theia, this body that collided with uh, the primordial Earth was a kind of ocean world. So like uh, so these uh, moons uh, with a lot of water, like Europa and Enceladus that we will uh, speak about uh, in a while. So from the moon, uh, what I want to share with you now is one idea that I follow with a lot of interest after some years from European Space Agency that is called the Moon Village. So the Moon Village is how we can, in a secure, fast, and not so expensive uh, way, to build a colony of humankind in the Moon. Of course, that the good idea is to use the local material, and in fact, is to cover this material, uh, the structure, with the soil from the Moon that will uh, pr uh, protect the humans inside uh, from the solar radiation, solar winds, and also from the uh, uh, radiation that comes from other stars. So this is really, really important. And so this, uh, 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 this project is, uh, is being prepared by European Space Agency, as I said, and I followed the, the, the project for several years now. Now, and so that could be a, a possibility uh, for uh, for us to use the, as you can see in, in the in this uh, in this cartoon, the, to use the the local material to build um, um, habitacles and to build uh, regions that are protected for. Uh, as you can see here, so the the materials that we must uh, carry to the moon, in fact, they are not so heavy, not big volumes, and they can be very, very effective in order to protect life on on the moon in this case, and protect them from uh, space weather and environment and so, and also to have this confined confined uh, environment where we can reproduce the conditions we must have to live with uh, uh, comfort. Okay, so from, let's 
go on and uh, now let's compare a little bit the <clears throat> the atmospheres that are in the hydrostatic equilibrium but let's say that our uh, atmospheric uh, terrestrial type atmospheres on the solar system so first of all let's uh, i will just pinpoint some values so if you see the radius of venus and earth they are almost the same the density also almost the same and the distance uh, to the sun of venus is uh, around 70 percent of the distance from earth to the sun but the, what is similar ended here because for venus the sidereal uh, uh, year that is uh, roughly 60 percent of one year on earth but the rotation period so one day on venus it's 243 days uh, earth days so it's much uh, slower it's almost uh, tidal co connected with the sun and also the obliquity is around 180 percent so it's reversed the rotation axis of venus venus rotates in the other direction in other sense comparing with earth another thing that i want to pinpoint uh, to you is the solar constant meaning the flux so the energy that arrives to the venus uh, per square meter meter by second is almost the double than on earth but now let's see the surface temperature that on venus is 460 degrees celsius it mean it means that the plum will melt at this temperature comparing with the uh, nice 15 uh, degrees Celsius and in average for Earth. Another thing is that the surface pressure, pressure on Venus, it's more than 90 times higher than on the surface of Earth. It means that like 10 meters on the ocean is about one atmosphere. So it's almost like being uh, one kilometer below the surface diving on the ocean so the pressure will crush something at these uh, pressures another thing is the composition and see the composition of venus the atmosphere that is uh 96 percent of co2 but also on mars is 95 percent of co2 this is relative composition so but it's very very similar Another thing, uh, see the nitrogen. Nitrogen on Venus is about 3%. Also on Mars, it's also 3%. So it's almost the same in relative. Makes sense that, of course, because the planets were formed more or less at the same time and from the same protoplanetary nebula, so from the same bricks. So we, we uh, think that in the beginning, the atmosphere of Venus, Earth and Mars might be very similar. However, the temporal evolution on Earth, because as we already spoke, that on Earth there are a lot of water, much more water than in other planets, it means that the ocean um, acts like a sponge to the CO2, absorbing the carbon dioxide. So remove the most of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's why you see on the atmosphere of Earth that is almost no uh, um, carbon dioxide. So, and after there was this very interesting and unexplained thing called life that appeared on Earth and started to pump up the oxygen in our atmosphere. But the basics on the past was CO2 and nitrogen, the same primordial atmospheres as on Venus and Mars. So just to finish this slide, the condensables on Venus is uh, sulfuric acid. So it rains sulfuric acid on Venus. On Earth, as we know, is mostly uh, it's water. And on Mars, there is some uh, ice uh, of water and CO2 that we will discuss. But we also have one moon from Saturn called Titan, which has a, an atmosphere, a dense atmosphere in hydrostatic equilibrium that 
is made mostly of hydrocarbons. Very, very weird, as we will see. Okay, another thing is dynamics. Dynamics is very important and different. As you can see in this image, Earth and Mars that I will call the fast rotators because Mars rotates one day on Mars is almost 24 hours as on Earth. So that affects dynamics in the same way. What we say uh, in, uh, in science, the Coriolis acceleration is uh, similar on Earth and Mars. So there is a huge impact in the dynamics, as you can see with westerlies and easterlies like, like we have on, on Earth, the trade winds and so on. For the case of Venus and Titan, because they, they rotate very, very, very slowly, as we discussed before, uh, the dynamics on the atmosphere is totally different. And uh, there is a major uh, model of the wind, uh, a major uh, wind uh, direction that is parallel to equated equator, and that we call the zonal wind, uh, as we see in Venus and Titan, and another very weird thing is that the wind and the atmosphere rotates much faster than the solid globe. Uh, on Venus, for example, the atmosphere rotates around 60 times faster than the solid globe. So you can imagine the wind. Eh? It's uh, something very, very, very weird. Okay, so now we will see something that we did for the... Uh, for we trained on Venus with aero braking. It's a maneuver that is re highly risky uh, on uh, on space exploration, meaning that is the uh, insertial orbit. For instance, another mission called Akatsuki from the Japanese space agency, uh, the first attempt to enter in orbit because the delta V, meaning the alteration of the velocity in order to enter the orbit, is so huge that burn the engines in the case of the Akatsuki. So what to, in the end of Venus Express mission, they started to try to have a drag of the higher levels of the atmosphere on the spacecraft in order to, to <clears throat> uh, cut the velocity, so to break the velocity, as you can see there. So a bit like surfing, on the high atmosphere of Venus. That is very important for the next missions to be efficient. So another thing about uh, uh, Venus that I want to share with you is that there are other places to spend our holidays in Venus. Because Venus, as we discussed already, has uh, around 40, 460 degrees Celsius at the, at the, uh, at the surface. And this is due to a uh, huge and uncontrolled, what we say, uh, 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 runaway greenhouse effect. And this greenhouse effect comes, of course, uh, from the case uh, that the composition of the atmosphere is uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, driven. So the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is so high that, as you be, see explained here very, uh, very briefly, all the greenhouse effect, uh, in fact, uh, acts on the atmosphere of Venus. So, now let's speak about Akatsuki. I'm an invited scientist from this uh, wonderful uh, Japanese mission. And the uh, ro rocket launcher uh, is, uh, the, the launch center is in the a tiny island in, south, in the south of Japan called the Tangashima island and it's just a curiosity because five more than 500 years ago uh, was the, to this tiny island that for with the winds that for the first time the portuguese arrived to japan to the same island same island then more than 500 years after i arrived again because or due to the winds in this case to the research of the winds, but in this case, the research of the winds on other planets. Okay, so let's move on. Here you can see some of the research that we perform uh, regarding the, in this case, uh, uh, Venus, and we can see here uh, some discoveries. Here is a major di disruption in the atmosphere of uh, 
Venus and I was connected with this discovery that came out uh, this research uh, article uh, in 2020 and here in the bottom on the left you can see uh, like a bow wave um, uh, that we uh, discovered in, in the infrared in this case was the was the <clears throat> Akatsuki mission the, the researchers and so let's move and see the different wavelengths when we are looking to a planet for instance on the left side uh, sorry yes on the left side here you can see on the visible and the ultraviolet we can see the higher levels of the atmosphere on the right side with radio and longer wavelengths you can study the topography so the regions uh, near the surface okay here we can also uh, pinpoint some very very uh, modern and nowadays problem that was uh, was claimed a detection of phosphine phd on venus and on on earth for instance in the, in the rocky planets phosphine is connected with life so this phosphine we don't know yet is an open question if it's connected with a previous life that uh, existed on Venus or not, or that perhaps could still exist at the cloud level. It's an open question. We are working and researching that, and it's quite interesting, but we don't have any, uh, any uh, final conclusions at this moment. On the bottom, we see the study of the dynamics with uh, a NASA telescope in Hawaii, and we can see here in some of the images uh, a hurricane, a huge hurricane on, on Venus. So, we uh, let's see how we perform this kind of science. So, I will share with you how myself and our, um, our colleagues, we can uh, retrieve the conditions in the surface. We can retrieve the wind systems on other, on other planets. So, in this case, we I will share with you uh, some uh, so, some studies concerning the atmosphere of Venus. So we can use at the same time coordinated observations from space using uh, uh, using uh, the different uh, spacecraft. In this case, was Venus Express before, and at the same time we will uh, use the big telescopes on on the ground so we will see from here this is thomas widman is a, a, a deputy pi of a new space mission to venus that is now in preparation called envision uh, that we are linked to of course and we are preparing it uh, was a i would say a dream from uh, thomas widman and colin wilson and uh, richard gale the three uh, deputy PIs of this uh, this space mission that was uh, around one month ago was uh, selected by European Space Mission. So we are in preparation now. So here, what you see in the image, we are climbing to the mountain, the beautiful mountain of Mount Akea, in order to reach the, te the, the the big telescope. In this case, the Canada France Hawaii telescope. So we are arriving here to the telescope. So I will go a little bit further. So sorry about that, but I want to share you more things. So let's go inside the, the telescope. So the, we are preparing, we are opening the dome, opening the dome and preparing. Oh, this is a very ugly guy that is uh, preparing to uh, perform the observations. <laughs> so let's see what we will do so these uh, observations uh, requ require um, to open the dome during the day we, for optical telescope it's not very often that it's possible to do that so we must have all time uh, a lot of security inside the the dome as you can see here it's colin wilson that is uh, uh, looking for reflected light inside the dome it's very very the, well we must control that very well so uh, let's go a little bit further 
So we now are performing the observations. We are preparing with the astronomers and we are preparing to uh, have access of the, of the data that uh, after came out to, to <clears throat> help us to retrieve the conclusions you saw on the, on the previous images I was telling you. Well, we are very high, so sometimes we needed oxygen, as you can see here. And uh, sometimes our brain doesn't work properly. I, I speak for myself. Sometimes to be in the mountain could be very, very difficult to be clever, to, to be bright when we are at a very, very high uh, level in the mountain. Okay, so let's go on. Let's leave uh, these guys still uh, performing the observations in the mountain and let's go to Mars. So we are on Mars now and let's see if it's possible to live on Mars. So there are plenty of missions around Mars or also in the surface with different rovers as you know and let's see what plans or what ideas were already being discussed in order to construct some uh, human colony on Mars. So let's see what can we do regarding going to Mars. So what I'm showing you is from NASA and it's uh, some projects in order to, to retrieve samples from underneath the surface to see if there is more water underneath the surface if there are microbial live uh, underneath the surface in order to be protected from the solar wind and so, because the atmosphere of uh, Mars is very tiny. So it doesn't protect too much the surface. And also uh, uh, because it's so, so uh, short the atmosphere, it means that the uh, the greenhouse effect in order to warm up the uh, the the atmosphere and the ground it's not very effective so what you are seeing here is a project that we will be see uh, in the in, in the near future but for real so here is a project a project to to build a first human colony on 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 mars at this time mostly uh, more at the engineer and scientific uh, approach but of course that will be for sure a first step in order to uh, to develop uh, a, a colony with uh, a lot of humans of course the, the difficulties are the how we come back from mars to earth going is much more easy then come back. We must have uh, a rocket and we must have fuel. So it's why having water and discovering water uh, as we already did on Mars, it's so important because with, uh, with water, we can decompose water and have hydrogen and hydrogen could be a good proper goal. So fuel for the rockets. And from the CO2, we can also break the CO2 and obtain oxygen in order to uh, humans to breathe. So this is what we are preparing at this time. So Mar uh, Mars has the, the rotational axis that is also banded like on Earth. So there are seasons. So in the winter season, as you can see in this image, in this cartoon, is covered by ice, two types of ice. The dry ice made of uh, uh, carbon dioxide, but also on, on the winter uh, pole, um, uh, on the winter hemisphere, I mean, uh, some uh, water ice also. So, and there are evidence about water on Mars, and we already found uh, using uh, uh, detectors from the, um, the space probes, uh, reservoirs of water underneath the, the surface. So that we know. Uh, one, one thing that is quite uh, 
uh, incredible on Mars and, and also dangerous is the dust storms. The dust storms could be uh, could cover all the planet. As you can see, the bottom on the right is a global dust storm that uh, hit Mars on 2018 in the summer. We are still uh, learning and and studying these uh, global dust storms because when there are humans living on Mars, that will be incredible and dangerous because dust will uh, constrain communications and also will cover the solar panels. So we must be very careful about obtaining energy. So, as you can see here, is uh, Mars totally covered by, by dust. Is why it's so important to study that. Another uh, project for the near future, future about Mars uh, the, that is the Perseverance that already arrived to Mars, as you know, a couple of months ago. And uh, <clears throat> from this uh, uh, rover that will collect samples on the soil, we will have another mission from European Space Agency that will uh, grab the, these uh, samples and will bring back to Earth. So this uh, return sample mission, it's quite uh, difficult, but I would say that is a first big, enormous step in order to develop uh, space exploration and first steps for humans living on other, uh, on other uh, <clears throat> bodies of solar system, solar system. Another thing that was also made a couple of months ago was to fly in a kind of uh, uh, helicopter uh, called with a very funny name called Ingenuity. Well, this is like a drone, as you see, but it's imagine it's not easy at all to fly on Mars because the density of the atmosphere is lower than 1% lower than 1% than the density of the atmosphere on, on Earth. So it's also why it's very difficult to land in, with security uh, on Mars, because the, 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 the atmosphere doesn't break the approaching probes very uh, in an effective way. So this is the, the main problem. So here we see the, the first fly on in another body of the solar system, so Ingenuity is preparing to fly here, and up we go. So this is really a very important step on space exploration. So from there we can uh, study that in, in more detail. Now let's see something that is very controversial in my opinion. I don't agree what I will show you now, but is a way of terraforming Mars, so changing the environment of uh, Mars in a way that disagree totally, that is using a new uh, nuclear bomb in order to increase the temperature and put the, the ice that is in the poles again in the atmosphere in order to increase the density of the atmosphere and also uh, with that uh, as a consequence to, uh, to increase the the greenhouse effect in order to uh, <clears throat> to have a, a higher density atmosphere and higher temperatures also. So, as I said, I disagree totally with this, but uh, as scientists, we must uh, uh, discuss all all the, the the ideas that came out and also uh, help with uh, arguments to discard this very, uh, I would say, uh, problematic ways to change things. So again, there are other more ethical ways of uh, increasing the quality uh, uh, for us, I would say, of the, the environment on, on Mars than these catastrophic ways. Okay, so now let's go to the, uh, to the, uh, to the <coughs> gas giant, Jupiter and Saturn, where there are huge uh, huge uh, <clears throat> storms. Even today, I was uh, uh, studying and 
uh, resuming my research about uh, Jupiter and what we can see here is new images that I want to share with you from Juno's NASA space mission that are beautiful I would say and quite detailed about Jupiter. Here we can see the rotation of Jupiter that is very very fast. For instance at the equator the velocity is uh, around at is around 10 kilometers per second that is huge okay and so the juno space mission that i was speaking from nasa that is now around uh, the orbit of uh, jupiter and providing these wonderful and incredible images i was showing to you like this one these are the best images we ever seen uh, and more detailed ones from jupiter so, and now let's speak about a uh, water world, Europa. One of the moons, the Galilean moons, that are covered by ice, but beneath the ice, there is, there, there is water. And due to the tidal forces, this water uh, beneath the ice cap, uh, uh, is the ice layer, is, uh, is heated up to till temperatures around 20 degrees Celsius. It's almost a spa and totally compatible with life as we know. So we don't know if inside this water there is life. So it's a target, a main target for astrobiology to, to study the geysers that expel water very rich in hydrocarbons molecules uh, from the inside of Europa. And so we are at this time studying as studying these ejections, like geysers, as you can see in this, uh, in this image, that it's a phenomenon of cryovolcanism. So it's uh, water from the inside that is uh, spread out, out from, from the Europa, and we can uh, study, study, and we can study uh, <clears throat> from the ground with uh, the ground-based telescopes, but also we are preparing in this case from NASA, uh, sorry, from European Space Agency, the JUICE mission, that one of the main targets will be exactly uh, to study these moons, like Europa and Ganymedes. So let's move to uh, no, another outer uh, uh, <clears throat> planet that is Saturn, and we can see here on the south some auroras due to the very strong magnetic field, and let's study now Titan, as we already spoke a little bit about the, the Titan that has uh, uh, atmosphere <coughs> in hydrostatic equilibrium that is rich in hydrocarbons and there are lakes at the surface. This is a lander in this image that came from a Cassini mission and landed on, on uh, Titan to study the this wonderful Titan moon that is uh, also uh, <clears throat> uh, very important for astrobiology uh, studies. So there were found some some uh, lakes on on Titan, and uh, these lakes are made not of water but from hydrocarbon. So from methane and ethane mostly. And there is a cycle of ethane and, and methane around this uh, this moon, this fantastic moon. And yeah, as you can see, these images are made from scientific real images captured by Cassini mission. Okay, let's move on. And now we move to Enceladus. And, and, and Enceladus is a little bit like Europa. So it's a moon from Saturn that also is a, a ocean world covered by ice and also with spurs of uh, water, cryovolcanism, these geysers, very rich on hydrocarbon uh, molecules and uh, also was found glycine, one amino acid in, in this water ejected by uh, Enceladus. So Enceladus is also really important for astrobiological studies. So now let's arrive now to the horizon of the solar system with new horizons that gave some beautiful images from Pluto. This is our views of Pluto around, 
um, along the time. So the next one, the 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 nearest one is that one with a, a new horizon that is incredible. And we made some studies about uh, <clears throat> the ices of nitrogen on on uh, on on uh, on Saturn, on Pluto. I mean, so. We are almost in the in the end now. We of this talk. I want also to tell you that we can also land and study more directly the comets. Here is the landing model called Philae from Rosetta mission that was it came out from the space probe and landed in a very difficult way, as perhaps you can remember. That was, in my opinion, a huge success. Anyhow to study the, a comet. Okay, and if we want to go further than the solar system, how can we travel? From here, it's just dreaming. Well, some educated dreams from science. How can we go around the interstellar um, travels? So, to reach the exoplanets, the planets that orbit other stars than the Sun. Sorry about the news, but one day the sun will die and will increase its <clears throat> size and will swallow Earth. So it's good that we start to look for new uh, houses. Of course, uh, sadly, this beautiful spacecraft is not on the market. It's from Star Trek. We can't use Enterprise, but we have some ideas how to go between uh, between different uh, uh, solar systems. So we can use uh, nuclear fusion and this idea uh, it's uh, called the Orion project. It's just of course at this time uh, some ideas that are being discussed. We didn't arrive to this yet. Another wonderful idea is to use the Buzzard Ramjet that is to use uh, the hydrogen that is diffused in the space to use them as fuel, which is great. We can also use antimatter uh, propulsion. It's another idea from Stephen Walking called the Starshot Project. And of course, we can uh, use a shortcut uh, from the wormholes, but uh, again, this is just beyond conjectures. Also, the electric cells, that is a new concept that captures the momentum and energy from the sun in order to accelerate a spacecraft, is also a good idea. So, we now we are looking for uh, exoplanets in the habitable zone. where So, this is a, a, a region where, uh, from the, the star, where the uh, planets can uh, have uh, water in the... <clears throat> in the liquid form. And we have some ideas, we have some measurements already for instance, from the Trappist system and others that are in this habitable zone. And we, uh, we have found more than 4,400 exoplanets still now, and we are studying them at this moment. Some are perhaps potentially habitable exoplanets, some are here. My bet is for Kepler 22b, but we have a lot of studies to do, and we must, uh, in fact, to to learn more to see if it's an exoplanet uh, from the type of Earth. It's like Earth, a paradise almost, or from Venus, like yeah, like hell, like incinerator. I will pass by the techniques for retrieving the exoplanets. I will not speak about that now and I will just tell you that one thing very important is to study the habitability and the atmospheres of the exoplanet. Something that we are doing now and preparing a mission where I am, I am a co-eye co of the, the space mission in preparation from European Space Agency called Ariel that will study the atmospheres of the exoplanets that were already found. So thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to uh, try to uh, discuss and to answer to some questions. Thank you. In my face, I was like, 
like this the whole time this is so interesting i think everybody finds uh, two topics in astronomy very interesting one is the alien life and one is how we can uh, build colonies on other planets and uh, we have many interesting questions as well in the chat but before i ask you those questions i also have some questions but before all that i would like to ask you especially about what is the question that you get asked the most or something that you know you would like to answer the question that you like to get asked you know i have such questions as an astronomer and i'm sure you must have as well so maybe something that you get asked a lot uh, you can tell us the question and answer that for us as well Can you hear me? Pedro, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? There are so many questions but before asking those questions to you, I would like you to tell us about the question that you get asked the most and answer that for us please. am i audible I, can somebody tell me in the chat box if i am audible or not am i not audible uh pedro can you switch to the uh, the stream yard the backstage area i think there you will get to hear my voice Okay, I am audible, but somehow Pedro cannot hear me. Can you hear me now? Yes, finally. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I was saying that I mean the 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 topic that you chose to talk about today is very interesting, and everybody likes these two topics. One is aliens, and one is how to colonize the other planets, right? So uh I mean before getting into the interesting questions that we have in the chat and I also have many interesting questions but before that I wanted to ask you uh what is the question that you get asked a lot about this topic and that you like to answer us Well uh is uh, if I want to go uh and try to be uh, uh living in a colony in other in, in other planet mm. uh It's very often mainly uh, kids when i go to schools they ask me very often and you do you want to go or what uh, yeah i think that they want to feel if it's i feel that is secure enough or will be secure enough and uh, well i trust on science totally and so i say yes if science says it's secure well i will i will go for sure and i will uh, want to to perform a lot of research there locally mm -hmm. definitely so uh, how how long do you think it is in the future that we will finally start establishing the colony in space because with the uh, spacex and all these uh, private sectors coming up with their own uh, ships wally got to space i'm so excited about that the blue origin and all this stuff happening we will go for sure it's just like a matter of time because of uh, course how much time do you think it will take how many no. years from now of course the time scales for space are longer than we are uh, acquainted let's say i would mm. say that for the moon and for having a proper uh, human colony on the moon i would say that will be 10 15 years so okay so it's on the corner yeah. we are we are already yeah. almost there but of course that i would say that the moon is a first testing place because mm -hmm. it's like a catapult for the next stage that is going to mars right and going to mars i'm pretty sure that we we will go or mm -hmm. not we, but perhaps our sons will go but i would say that for mars is a bit more tricky it's needed a little bit more engineering because mm -hmm. farther away and also the returning from the from mars as i explained it's not very easy so mm -hmm. i would say that a colony with humans on on mars 
from 20 to 40 years. Mm -hmm. but for we will but that is that is still very close in the future i mean i thought you would say that it will at least be 100 years but that's still very close you know <laughs> and it will be for sure you will see <laughs> mark my <laughs> words <laughs> <laughs> yes definitely okay so continuing on the question that you get asked the most i wanted to ask you which is the planet in our solar system or the body in our solar system because we also spoke about the satellites of the other planets which can be habitable so where would you like to go and colonize? Well, I would say the the best option will be Mars. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the moon, uh, the moon is, almost, there is no atmosphere on, on the moon. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that the moon is a good proxy for going to, the, to Mars. Mm -hmm. And as I explained, Venus is very interesting. For me, is the most interesting and intriguing atmosphere. It's I would say that Venus is a planet that lost e e its habitability. Mm -hmm. Perhaps in the past it mm -hmm. was habitable, but now it's like a furnace. It's like hell. So uh, with uh, huge temperatures and and, uh, yeah. and pressures, so it's not the best uh, place to go. So I would say that Mars is the best option, but in the in the, in a more further away future, I would say that Titan is also very very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Even if mm -hmm. temperatures are much lower because we we are around Saturn, so we are much away from the sun. Right, right, okay. So continuing on this, um, I mean, of course, we heard that there are many satellites as well, like Titan or Europa. Uh, I was thinking about Europa and you saying that these are also habitable. I think if we, if I ask this question to Neil deGrasse Tyson, where he would like to go to uh, colonize, he would say he would like to go on Europa and go ice fishing there, right? <laughs> we, know, we don't know. Could be, eh? could be because... Uh... As I said, as a, in an astrobiological approach, Europa is really, really interesting because mm -hmm. because it's covered by some kilometers of ice, is protected from the the radiation from outside. So beneath the ice layer, it's mm -hmm. quite secure. One thing. Mm -hmm. Second, there is water. So this uh, this uh, molecule that's a polar solvent. So for astrobiology, it's really, really important. Another mm -hmm. thing, it's very rich in hydrocarbon molecules, even complex hydrocarbon molecules. Mm -hmm. As I said, even amino acids were found in the geysers spurring out from these moons, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. And another thing is that the temperature due to the tidal forces with huge Jupiter and also for Enceladus that's similar uh, mm -hmm. nearby uh, Saturn, uh, this friction inside the fluid, it warms up the fluid. So the, mm -hmm. in our models, the temperature beneath the surface is around 20 degrees Celsius, totally mm -hmm. compatible with life as we know. Yeah. So we don't know if there are jellyfishes uh, swimming around <laughs> Europa. Or Maybe a big shark or a whale just going around the icy crust. We don't know, but perhaps they are there. As we speak, we don't know, <laughs> but perhaps yeah, we, can, yes. we can go with uh, with uh, some scuba diving and uh, go right. and, uh, and and explore these wonderful worlds. Could be <laughs> right, right. So what I gathered from your talk is that I think there are three important things uh, to understand about any astronomical body to understand if well, we can colonize it or not. First is its distance from its host star because it provides it energy and uh, that balances the temperature on that astronomical body. It should be survivable. I mean, Mars is too cold for us to go and uh, colonize it, right? That's why the life does not exist. Or you also mentioned that we could go underground on the Mars so that it's a bit hotter there. So the second thing that's important is the temperature. And third thing is water. But on the satellite of Saturn, you said that there is no water and it is also very further away from the sun. Also, Europa is very further away from the sun. It's, it's uh, basically just ice. 
so how would it get energy would it get energy from the gas giants uh, jupiter and uh, saturn well you pin pointed very well I, I i think the major questions for for hypothetical colonization uh, mm -hmm. regarding mars if the uh, mars is really in the border in the border of uh, uh, the habitable zone meaning right. to be in the in the fluid form so uh, if we can increase the density of the atmosphere of mars and there is that there, there are other ideas than this crazy idea with a nuke there is no need for that there are other options and if we have more air more density we increase yeah. Uh, the greenhouse effect and so if we increase the greenhouse effect will be warmer mm -hmm. more in the past in, in the primordial mars uh, mars were uh, mars had the conditions for having uh, water in liquid form we have plenty of uh, scientific evidence of about that so in the past was much warmer so it could uh, mm -hmm. uh, secure life as we know well regarding the moons like europa or enceladus well we must uh, uh, live like dolphins in, in inside the, <laughs> the planet yes. uh, dive maybe we will water. also evolve to have things like fish so that we can live underground <laughs> exactly exactly that will be very handy by the way <laughs> of course <laughs> for breeding, for breeding uh, for us, at least, we must decompose water, uh, the hydrolysis of water, and obtain oxygen to breathe. That uh, is possible. Uh, so there is a lot of water. For instance, Europa has more than the double of all mm. the water that exists on Earth. So it's wow. a huge, it's a huge amount of water in Europa. Also in Enceladus, there is a huge amount of water. So we have mm -hmm. enough water on uh, Titan. We don't know yet, but we can mm -hmm. obtain, for instance, oxygen for breathing from other molecules, from, from CO2 mm -hmm. or other molecules. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to save my last question uh, for the last of this session. And uh, I want to ask questions by our participants. So I can see an interesting uh, question in the chat. Let me just uh, pin it over here. So somebody has asked, uh, can we habitat on Proxima Centauri B? So maybe in generalized terms, you can tell us if we can habit on stars, and if not, why not? First, without my head of a scientist, I would want to to answer. I hope so. <laughs> I love that that will be possible. Now I must put my head of scientist and uh, say tell you that, sorry, at this moment, we don't have a, a clear answer. We don't mm. know yet. But what I want to share with you is that we are almost in a daily basis, we are uh, um, uh, founding more exoplanets, so extrasolar planets. And some mm. of them have the flux from the star, the energy flux, that is compatible with the habitable zone. So mm -hmm. we must think that is not exactly the same habitability and habitable zone. Habitable zone just means water at the surface in a liquid form. Habitability mm -hmm. is much more interesting for us because mm -hmm. it's the pressure, it's the temperature uh, that is uh, convenient for us, for life as we know. And mm -hmm. we found already hundreds, hundreds of exoplanets uh, that uh, could have these uh, these qualities. And again, what we know today is that most of the stars have planets around them, and there are billions, zillions of stars. So, mm -hmm. in, in, if one star has or is uh, or orbited by more than one planet, so you see yeah. the possibilities. The odds are incredible. We will have. Yeah zillions of exoplanets so for sure that we will find some planets that are uh, suitable for us but i want to share with you one idea uh, ethical let's say ethical connected to science idea mm -hmm. but for me 
we we just are entitled to arrive there if mm -hmm. we take good care of our own planet. It's exactly. not a planet. Well, not a planet we. First, we must gain the time, the, the huge time scale mm -hmm. to develop engineer mm -hmm. science in order to arrive to these other planets. So mm -hmm. we it's like a natural selection from Darwin. We will arrive to other planets just if we today we are wise enough to take good care of our planet. So we will exactly. have time and time to develop science and engineer to go to these other planets. But I'm quite mm -hmm. optimistic. We will arrive there. Definitely. We are bright. <laughs> we together we will do it. Exactly. Astronomy is such an international science and it brings the whole humanity together. So you now we should understand that we are just a species put floating on a pale blue dot in this massive universe. And as you rightly said, if we just clutter a lot and we swim in our own uh, uh, clutter of plastic, it will be really hard for us to do the science and actually figure out how to colonize the other planets and continue with the human race. So moving on with the next question. Um, uh, have you heard about the Kardashev scale? Sorry, no. Please share with me. You can see perhaps in my last slide my email. Please share with me because I'm very curious. Like <laughs> definitely, a scientist. Definitely. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. So the next question is: Will the habitation of another planet make effects in human biological flow? That's an interesting Thank one. You. This is a very important question. Of course, of course. I agree entirely with you that this is a major thing to think about and to anticipate. Uh, one thing that you perhaps you are aware of about that, that for the missions, for instance, to go to Mars, we are already training uh, with uh, people to see if uh, they can adapt of uh, uh, some alterations in gravity, duration the length of the day it is not the case on mars because the length of the day is the same on, by coincidence is the same it's 24 hours on mars like like on earth but yes this is something that we must take in account and prepare because i think that life is the most valuable thing in the universe that i know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so for that we must take good care because life is precious so it's not just sending people to mars in, with a one-way ticket and they do what they want it's like a yeah. suicide a sister suicide I, I don't agree with that so mm -hmm. life is very very important so we must cherish cherish and take mm -hmm. good care of life so prepare people and astronauts that if go to another planet to live there with secu security, with comfort, uh, mm -hmm. all time. So, and we must, this is something that uh, in mm -hmm. the space exploration and engineering for space, we must take in account all time. We see, mm -hmm. for instance, astronauts in the International Space uh, Station, and I'm a friend of uh, one of the commanders uh, <clears throat> called Thierry Wirtz, that was. He was commander wow. from for some time. And uh, he, he said to me, it's very, I, I work out every day because otherwise mm -hmm. I will lose the, the muscles and my power. And even so, when I return to, to, to Earth, to the ground, for the first days I almost couldn't move because I mm -hmm. don't, didn't have enough strength. And I, mm -hmm. I did the workout every day so this is very important is uh, the experience he shared with us mm -hmm. i think even this research field is very open for the doctors uh, who, who are into astronomy you know because of course as you said when uh, the astronauts come from the space or when they travel in the space for a lot of time it affects their body and uh, that that has been scientifically proven so of course the biological effects must be huge and this is a big field of uh, science and especially for doctors uh, to explore the human body and biology. Okay, moving on to next question. 
Uh, Pooja Goroni says that it was a wonderful session. My question is, transforming of Mars is not possible today. But do you think in future, with better technology, we can transform Mars? Thank you, Pooja, for this question. Of course, that I was teasing a little bit to see if some of you will put that question. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, because as you understood, I'm totally against using uh, nuclear bombs to to destroying in a way uh, the environment and the balance in other planet. We must uh, respect the other bodies of the solar system or any other exoplanets, and we don't know yet if there are there is life on Mars. Perhaps could be underneath the surface, so we must respect that. And make a lot of tests and and deep uh, research in order to make sure if there is or not life. If there are any kind of life, the planet is theirs. It's not ours. Mm -hmm. You know, must respect that. Yeah. If there is no life at all, we can transform a little bit the planet. And uh, I love your question. Thank you again. <laughs> so we can, for instance, it's a very very simple idea, but cover with a kind of algae. That, that are uh, dark, and for that they will co and cover the ice with this kind of algae, and this algae can absorb much more uh, radiation that will melt the ice in a very soft, uh, slow, but steady way. And with mm. that, they, after the vaporization, will they put these uh, molecules again in the atmosphere will steady and slowly in the smoothy way increase the density of the atmosphere and from there as a consequence and due to greenhouse effect remember that it's mostly due to the carbon dioxide the, the atmosphere mm -hmm. and also the ice is mostly on on mars will increase the temperature and the pressure and will be much more comfortable for for life as we know so right. the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, moving on to another question. This is a bit technical coming from a person who has technical background. Uh, what if we can build human colony bases on the surface of uh, on the surface by shielding the solar radiation using magnetic fields from small cubesats? Can that be feasible? Well, I don't think it, this is feasible. In, in a theoretical approach, perhaps yes. Uh, perhaps your idea is using a kind of uh, Faraday cage or something like that. So, in principle, in theory, it's some somewhat possible. I don't think that is uh, uh, effective, at least for a long time. So, mm -hmm. perhaps in a, in a far future, we can develop this kind of. Uh, of technology, but for a near future or medium future, I don't think mm. it would be uh, available. And even if there was a perturbation in this uh, kind of fire decay, well, the life that is underneath, if there was a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, now going to the very much basics of this whole atmospheric study, there is a question, how does Earth's atmosphere form? Very good question. So, what we know today is there is first in the primordial uh, in the primordial uh, phase of the planetary formation, uh, due to one of the basic laws on physics that is the the uh, minimal energy principle. So, to lower the potential energy, the dense materials go to the center. So differentiation in the interior. So we have the nucleus of of Earth with nickel and, and, and iron. And after we have the mantle with uh, silicates, and after we have the crust with carbonates, and after we have water in the oceans, if there is, and after we have a degassing of the uh, light, lightest forms and um, mostly not uh, polar forms of molecules to the atmosphere, like N2, nitrogen, O2, oxygen, CO2, dioxide, carbon dioxide, and others for different atmospheres. So this is the first primordial 
atmosphere due to the degassing from the interior, from the natural differentiation. Now we have a bombardment coming from outside because you can imagine the principle of the solar system. It was a lot of traffic jams in the, with a lot of rockets and asteroids and comets colliding with Earth. That provided a lot of water and other molecules. So some of these molecules uh, end up in the atmosphere. And also, uh, <clears throat> so we can have major collisions coming from outside, as I discussed about this uh, uh, water world called Theia that collided with Earth. Okay, but, sorry, well, it's information, but after there is the temporal evolution, and the mm -hmm. temporal evolution depends on the, for instance, the, in the greenhouse effect, for instance, mm -hmm. that it, on, for instance, the the warmer body on the solar system is not Mercury, that is close mm -hmm. to the sun, is Venus, due mm -hmm. to the greenhouse effect, and so we must be very very careful with global, uh, with. Uh, with the uh, greenhouse effect and the uh, global warming on Earth, in our planet, because uh, we see that on Venus, putting in context is very, very uh, annoying. So we must be very careful. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Okay, all right, we'll just take one last question and then we will move on. Again, this question is from Varun Nikam. He's asking, how can the use of greenhouse effect on Mars help in creating sustainable environment for us? That's a very good question. I already started to, to speak about that a little bit uh, ago. But of course, this question makes a lot of sense because mm -hmm. it's, it's something that we can do in, uh, as, I sh as I shared with you for this idea for Mars, for instance, we can, uh, when there is ice, CO2 ice, so dry ice or water ice, we can uh, have some impact on this ice and increase the vaporization of this material and with that increase the density of the atmosphere. These greenhouse gases as uh, methane, for instance, uh, or it is happening now, so perhaps you heard on the news what happened now, these months on Earth, with very high temperatures in Siberia and North Canada, incredible. Mm -hmm. And the permafrost, so the iced soil that is melting, is melting and the, is full of uh, uh, methane from older uh, uh, forests that uh, in other areas existed. So this methane is coming to the atmosphere. And methane is a very ex effective greenhouse effect gas, more than CO2. So for the greenhouse effect and global warming on Earth is very, very uh, painful and, and dangerous. So we must control mm -hmm. that. And in other planets, we can, of course, knowing better, we, we, we can uh, have some um, positive side effect on this, controlling a little bit in order, for instance, as your question, to improve the, uh, uh, the atmosphere to be more sustainable, to, to more comfortable for life as we know, or for us, for mm -hmm. astronauts, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So we can actually keep going with the question and answers and it's never ending with this topic. But I think we will have to have another session with Pedro, especially dedicated to the question and answers uh, about this. Now, before ending this session, I would like to ask my question that I told you, the interesting question I was saving for the last, which people actually ask me, but I never know how to really answer that. And maybe you can tell us about it. So people ask me that, why are we thinking about uh, building colonies on other planets and habiting the other planets when we have so many problems here on Earth? So rather than solving the problem here on Earth, why are we, you know, trying to look for planet B? Can you maybe answer that for us? Makes a lot of this question. I'm also worried about these, uh, the basics of this, uh, of this question. So what is my idea about that? So, uh, of course, we must take care about people on Earth first. Of course, that we must... Uh, 
uh, help each other first. That's the pr priority. However, developing the science and the technology on the space is like a laboratory. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if you see uh, space exploration already helped to save our planet and outcome. Mm -hmm. For instance, the Apollo mission to the moon, they developed one technology that is very important today to control uh, climate change, that is solar panels. Mm -hmm. So that comes from the space. More. One thing that is being done today and in this no new uh, rush to the moon, that is using water, as I said, and break the water uh, in hydrogen and oxygen. And hydrogen is a fuel very important, not mm -hmm. just for space, not just for colonies on, on the moon, on Mars, and on other exoplanets. It's for Earth. So this, uh, this uh, lab that is uh, like the Formula One for the, car, for the uh, cars, so it's to increase, to develop to the highest level the technology. So we can test this on space mm -hmm. for using hydrogen as a new fuel, a green hydrogen. And with that, we'll be better for everyone on our Earth because we will not depend more on, on fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. And another thing, for instance, for food, there is no way or from inorganic materials to build food for us. There is a problem that is the chirality of the molecules. When we produce in a factory uh, glycids or lipids or proteins, they come in two different optical isomers. And one is toxic and we can't, mm -hmm. we don't know how to separate them. But with space exploration, and with the help of astrobiology, perhaps we will learn, we don't know yet how to do it, but if mm -hmm. we know how to do it in order to produce food from uh, or inorganic materials on Mars or in, in a longer, long space uh, trip or in other exoplanet, we will use this for producing food for everybody from inorganic with water and inorganic materials. And that mm -hmm. will be awesome for the future. So, Definitely. See, and even for medicine, for instance, the, mm -hmm. the MRI uh, te technology in medicine to see how we are made inside and, uh, and so, and also the TAC uh, techniques were developed from the space exploration. Mm -hmm. so, space is helping the day to day even in your bicycles, you, I don't yes. know if you <laughs> in your bicycles, you have a piece of the space exploration, that is the reflectors. The reflectors mm -hmm. were made by the first time, for the first time, for, for going to the moon. There are some reflectors on the moon that was, were put by the astronauts in order that with a laser, we launch to the moon mm -hmm. and back the echo, we can measure with very the detailed distance. Mm -hmm. the distance between the moon and Earth. And we know, due to that, that the moon is going a little bit away. And finally, yeah. one thing that we use in our clothes, Velcro, mm -hmm. was made for the first time for space exploration. Even mm -hmm. a day-to-day -day thing. Why? Because buttons and zippers for an astronaut Oh, that's impossible. <laughs> you can imagine. You put on a thing. Velcro is much, <laughs> much more handy. Eh? <laughs> Definitely. So I think, I think, you know, people should know how astronomy is making their day-to-day -day life uh, very easy. You know, it, not a lot of people know that. And they always ask, why is it important to study astronomy? And I say that there are two main rules of astronomy. You know, if you want to get into astronomy, you should know that. First is you have to think big. You cannot think small. The universe is massive. The space is massive. So you have to think big. And second is you have to think long term. You cannot uh, get something just the next day. Like you do astronomy today and you get something the next day. It's not something that you can prepare and experiment in, in a laboratory and you find something today 
or you gain lots of money tomorrow you know you have to invest and you have to dream for a long term goal and a long term success so i think your talk pedro has proved these two points and i'm sure everybody has loved talking to you today and we are definitely going to want to talk to you again because there are still so many questions that i want to ask to you and i'm sure everybody also have them in mind thank you so much for giving us your time uh, we are exceeding our time limit now with like 45 minutes so thanks a lot <laughs> yes we can keep talking about this right so again let me thank you from aspan era for joining us today and talking with us about exploring the possibility of building habitable life on other planets thank you so much again and everybody i know pedro told you about how to find the other planets just a little bit but if you want to know more we have a course on astronera.org uh hosted by ellen glad the course name is uh scientific applications of astronomical observation so you can go on this course and you can find more about how to discover exoplanets there so again uh i would like to thank you pedro <laughs> thank you It was a big pleasure bye bye thank you bye bye everybody and clear skies